Well, welcome to this next step in the Wild Times series. Um, we often, right now, certainly uh, you find wireless technology all over the place, smartphones are all over, uh, there's social networking going on, we have Twitter, Facebook, etc. And none of these things really existed much at all 20 years ago. Um, and when you're in the midst of it, you just do it. Kids do it. You just do it. You just live it. You don't quite uh, have a perspective on how things got to be here. And in this series, as it's just another example of how wild the time is, how rapid the changes are. And what I've tried to do in this series is uh, try to take a step back and try to look at what's happening now as a part of the movement of the evolution of humanity. Um, and I think it gives us a much more interesting picture and a much fuller idea of where we came from and where we might be going. So, uh, that's the way we're, the strategy we're going to use. Pull back, take a broader view. Slide. So, first of all, uh, of all the living creatures in the world, uh, human beings are probably the most preeminent social species. We can't exist without one another. We can't even uh, stay sane without one another. If you can't talk to somebody or get in touch with them over the telephone, if you're out of touch for days, you literally will start to become mentally uh, deranged. Um, so, we are a social species, this building, everything that exists, your automobile, these things couldn't have been made by one person or even six billion people working independently of one another. You can't make cars, you can't build complex structures, you can't do science. So, um, what we're going to talk about today in terms of the information explosion and the uh, interconnected global society began with language about uh, maybe uh, 70,000 years ago. And that was, what is language about? Why do we have language? Well, it's about information, about how to transfer information back and forth, because that information is important, it's useful, it helps you speak to your offspring, your child, that helps the child speak to you, that helps a group of people plan where they're going to go hunting, and so on and on. So information is really the critical aspect of language. Language is just the vehicle, the alphabet, the words in the dictionary, all of that is like um, the uh, boxcars or the gondola cars and the train, they're the vehicles. What goes in those things is the information because it caught, the information is what makes things happen. So, uh, when human beings began to speak and acquire language, I call this the first information age. Right now we think we're living in an information age. And indeed, it's a perfectly appropriate name for it because we didn't think much about that before. But really there was a first information age when human beings could transfer information back and forth to each other and what it was based upon was speech and assembly. Speech, like I'm talking to you now, assembly, like you're here now, and if, if, if you are a mile away, you're not going to you're not going to you're not going to communicate with me, and I'm not going to communicate with you. We, ha our ancestors at that time, had to be in a group. You had to assemble together, and then you could share information. It was also a time of illiteracy. There was no reading and writing. And our hunter-gatherer ancestors shared their decision-making because they were in small groups. So if there was men in the tribe, which might number on the scale of like 50 individuals, 30 to 50 individuals, 
they sort of adult men who are going to do the hunting would sort of plan their, their day together, they'd share their decisions. Some who are really skilled would probably get a little more consultation than others, but it was still a very much group decision making process. Now, after agriculture begins, about 10,000 years ago, we begin to have these empires, the Mesopotamian Empire, the Egyptian empires, that were built along rivers and river valleys where they could cultivate crops, build canals, raise lots of grain, and support large populations. And these populations, of course, also were melded together in armies. And this is the time that we're talking about from 10,000 years ago onward to uh, maybe 2,000 years ago, the time everybody's familiar with the Bible. The Old Testament is, is basically a chronicle of those kinds of times and that kind of living. It was top down, command and control, no more shared decision making. The king or the leader, with a few of his trusted uh, associates made the decisions about what was going to happen and everybody fell into step and went along with it. There wasn't a, a, a shared decision making like our hunter-gatherer existence. So top-down information flow is like an upside-down tree. Well, it could be the right-side-up tree, but it's like a tree. Your source is where the trunk comes out and the information flows up, up the trunk to the branches, to the leaves. And the leaves are like the receivers of information. So it's a tree structure, top-down information. And during this period, from the development of these um, um, early agricultural empires, even up until the present, the government, of course, was uh, not a government of the kind that we understand today, or even the kinds of governments that existed, say, two or three hundred years ago. These were um, uh, princely states governed by kings and nobles and their associates. And, of course, there was a very strong component of religion, not just the Israelites. All of these uh, cultures had religion, and religious leaders and religious uh, principles were incorporated into the governance. So the government and the religious leaders had control of speech and assembly. And if you wanted to get up and speak, you were not going to do that unless the king was happy to have you do that. And in fact, we get some evidence of this in uh, the Old Testament. Uh, prophets like Jeremiah. He's getting up to speak and they're saying, shut up, and they throw, put him in a well. So getting hold of the public square is a kind of valuable territory for power and control. So the speech and assembly, and it's just speech, there's no, there's no mass communication with writing. There may be a few scribes, but that's a very specialized thing. And there's still mass illiteracy. Most people cannot read or write. There's no writing. And then in the 15th century, something very important happens. The uh, printing press in the West begins to be invented, and printing technology then starts to spread all over. So this is the second information age, where now print. <coughs> First is speech and assembly. Second stage is print. And the rise of print media means the rise of literacy. Now you have to be able to read and write. And books and newspapers and broadsides. Broadsides are like posters with political slogans on them that people put up. Uh, and we, we see the beginnings, the first beginnings of the democratization of information. So it's not just the top-down sending it out. It's still very much top-down. But it's the first beginnings of the democratization. Other people can publish things, not just one single source. But, of course, 
there's a reaction. Government and religious institutions which previously held the public square want to get control of print media. So you find that the government says, we will run the newspapers, and the religious authorities say, you can't read any books if you want. In fact, they shouldn't even exist. So there's an index of forbidden books that comes into being, and of course there is censorship by the state of the writing that's available. And I guess I don't have to tell you that some of our most important scientific texts were put on the index of forbidden books. So there was a strong attempt because people understood that information was, was a very precious commodity and you better hang on to it and not let other people get a hold of it. Now we enter a third information age in the 20th century, which is the rise of mass media and communication. So the printing press was okay, and you could make lots of copies of books and ship them around Europe and uh, other places. But now we have mass media, which is far more instantaneous. It not only includes print, which has existed since the press, it now includes the telephone. You can call people up and talk to them and pass information around that way. You can alert them. Uh, you can pass them secrets. And then radio is another mass medium of communication. What's, what's on the radio? It's information. What's on television? It's information. So now we have quite a mixture of mass media, but it's still very much top down. It's still a tree. The sources of information, NBC, CBS, are few. And the consumers of information are the whole population, many. So that's again the tree structure. A few, few sources feeding into the trunk of the tree, and the population out on the leaves, they just receive, they don't uh, create or source any of the information. There is at this time, in the 20th century, declining government and religious control of media and communication, particularly in the Western democracies. Now, that's not true in the Soviet Union, it's not true in China, it's not true in most of the undeveloped world. Um, now, uh, something new happens with uh, mass media and the government taking less of a role instead of controlling all the newspapers, William Randolph Hearst comes forward and other uh, people who saw the media as something that private individuals could take advantage of and monopolize. So you have the problem now of monopoly control of media by individuals and they can control print, radio, and television. I can't remember how to push the button here. The red I to do that. Well, never mind. I don't think I need to point it out to you. And even in our time, uh, massive amounts of the communication and information network of the world uh, is in the control of Rupert Murdoch and his associates and his family. He's an Australian. He happened to have invested very heavily and owns an enormous amount of media. He's an immediate empire. Uh, he's never run for political office, but he exerts a very powerful control on the politics of the countries in which his company runs most of the media. And he runs a good bit of the media in the United States, like Fox, the Fox Network and Fox News, for example. He owns now the Wall Street Journal. Um, and it very much reflects his particular political opinions about how things should be. Uh, in Italy, the Prime Minister, well, he was until he was uh, forced to resign. Uh, Silvio Berlusconi is the, owns all the media just about in Italy. He owns all the television, he owns the print, and he got himself elected Prime Minister, and of course there are people who clustered around him who want him to be, but it's, it's like uh, mass media has made it possible for individuals to acquire enormous amounts of power over information. 
So that's a development that uh, maybe wasn't anticipated with the printing press. However, something else is going to happen. We're going to have the fourth information age, which is the age we have recently entered, the 21st century. Of course, we're already getting into it in the 20th, but we have to round it off. And this is what we call the information age. But I want to point out to you, it's like the fourth information age. Um, it is the World Wide Web and the democratization of information that comes with it. So instead of top-down command and control, which is that tree structure, what we have now is a net, a network of everybody connected to everybody else. So the tree has been replaced by a net. And what goes on on that net in its best possible light is sharing and consensus building. And I'll try to say more about how that might take place in a minute. So we have in the developed world now a pretty fully networked society Especially Japan and Korea, they have really wonderful networks, far superior to ours. Uh, we have a smartphone, which is more than just a phone. It's a small computer, it can take video and record video and audio. Uh, it's a kind of very important extension of human reporting and information gathering capacity. The video is especially important because the smartphone can be used to document. It's not just hearsay. Now, you can say, well, people can Photoshop videos and so forth. I'll say something about just how capable people are doing that. But it's very important that somehow, suddenly, means of documentation are in the hands of the receivers of information. In fact, the receivers of information and the senders of information are very much in the same pool. It's, not, it's a network, it's not a tree structure. We also have these uh, social networking sites in which people share information and which obviously had tremendous impacts on the political systems that were uh, slightly under the control of, not slightly, but very much under the control of top-down information. The information revolution, the revolution that took place in the Middle East about a year ago, were in countries that were run by top-down information uh, governments. Uh, there was censorship, control of newspapers, control of state, state-run television, and so on. Uh, Facebook and Twitter and email and smartphone postings made a very big impact and made it possible for those controls on information to be circumvented by a new way of people communicating. So in the information age, now I'm just going to call it the information age, like we always talk about it. Again, we want to think about it as the fourth information age. The source of information are in the same set as the consumers of information. And that is a very radical change from anything our species has ever known except for our ancient ancestors, the hunter-gatherers. That's the situation they were in. And it took us a while, but we've somehow gotten back to something more akin to that. Now, government and religious institutions still want to control things, so they're trying to find ways to control the internet. And you see this especially in the developing world, because they still have one foot in the past. And you see it, there is one very powerful country that is still semi-developed, and that's China. And the Chinese government is still in this transition stage of trying to come to grips with how you make a governing society that's not just top-down, because it's not acceptable anymore, and what happens is, there will be a revolution and it will overthrow it. And then the next one comes in and they install a top-down government until there's enough dissatisfaction and inequality and it's overthrown. So there's obviously a lot that has to take place. But it's also true in a place like Iran 
where the government controls the information. It tries to, it's tried now to make its own internet so that people in Iran won't look at the internet that the rest of the world looks at. They'll be stuck with the things that the religious authorities approve of. And they are barely successful at it. But for people who don't care, people in the countryside perhaps in Iran and other places uh, that just don't particularly care, are not very well educated, they may passively accept it. But most of the people in the cities, most of the people who are educated, and it's a pretty highly educated population in Iran, they all have software to get around the government control. So they, they're on Facebook and Twitter even though the government doesn't want them to be. So when you have a network and they're sharing and distributed decision making, there's going to be enhanced creativity with a free flow of ideas. That's going to be a fact. And there's going to be a second fact, which I'm going to say much more about, which is natural selection of information. And I mean this in a Darwinian sense. I mean it in the sense of evolution. Um, Lisa alluded to the fact that there's all kinds of garbage on the internet, and indeed there is. Uh, that's the nature of human life, and we haven't had the internet before, so people are still quite accustomed to deception, to putting out false information. They think it will be just fine. In fact, it's even better because we can reach more people with false information. Uh, what they fail to recognize is the internet is also a forum. It's a place where people can look at what has been posted and comment on it, point out where it's false, and it can slowly be vetted. Slowly there will develop a consensus of that was a bunch of garbage that was published. I, I may have thought it was right when I first saw it, but since then, so many other people have posted on it, and it's and slowly, 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 it shakes down, and you're left with some truth. And the reason you're left with that is that shakedown process involves lots of eyes looking at the same thing, lots of ears hearing the same message. So false and deceptive information gets challenged by truthful information. And finally, I can't not help but mention that this whole information age is coming simultaneously at the time when there is, this is also a very scientific age, in which the way we get at truth has to have a lot to do with repeatability, verification. Someone else goes out and observes what you claim you observed and checks to see that that's what in fact it is. So we have a scientific perspective on getting at what is what. How do we understand what we're looking at? What is really happening here? And people can say, well, that was a great scientific theory, but actually it's probably wrong because of this data I have. And indeed, it happens in science all the time. Uh, and, and then a new theory is developed, more data comes in, and things are refined, and pretty soon something becomes settled science, like something as bizarre as evolution. So I want to say something now about the attempt to control. Uh, there's a lot of attempt that's going on right now of governments and religious institutions. Again, this is mostly in the undeveloped or semi-developed world. Uh, to control the net, to control the internet. Uh, for example, I think the new Egyptian parliament, which is dominated by fundamentalists, uh, has passed a law that makes it illegal to use Facebook for a month because some of the legislators were offended by uh, that the prophet was being insulted on Facebook. So when you have a constrained society and a constrained network, 
you're going to have falsehood going unchallenged. But truth will emerge in networks with a free flow of information because of this process that I described in which you can't sustain a lie indefinitely when other people are looking at that lie. And it's analogous to the case of a bad scientific theory. A bad scientific theory is not going to stand because in science there is developed, perhaps more so than any other human institution, a uh, tradition of trying to prove the theory wrong. You make a great name for yourself if you can prove that the Einstein theory of relativity actually is in error. But so far, every experiment everything that has been measured says that in its range of behavior that it describes, it is quite an accurate theory. So, um, truth emerges in networks with a free flow of information. And I think human beings will slowly learn that and will gravitate to it and will say, we don't want legislatures who want to impose constraints on the internet or where we get our information, or our newspapers, or our television, or our books. We don't want religious institutions with that power. And lastly, um, I, 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 I put this in a kind of smart, smart out way. Minds become smarter, but I, what I really mean by that is the social minds that we have, which are partly ours, but they're also partly stimulated and activated by the society in which we're interacting with others, these minds are becoming more skillful at ferreting out falsehood and propaganda and uh, claims that are purely self-interested uh, and so on. And this is a slide I showed last time at the last talk about the uh, decline of violence. And what I was trying to point out in that slide is that what has happened over the last um, half century is that the intelligence tests that people take, and they take them worldwide, all countries give IQ tests, and they're more or less the same, and I think you've all had experience with them, the scores keep climbing. And so the testing people have to make new tests every 10 years or so because everybody is just getting higher and higher scores. And there's a very important thing about these, the, these, the behavior of these scores. This is empirical evidence. Um, does it mean that people are getting smarter? In some ways, yes, it does. Does that mean that evolution has, our brain is evolving? No, because the brain can't evolve quickly in a matter of 10 years. It takes hundreds of thousands, if not a million years. But the structure that the brain has put there, the limbic system of the emotions, the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus that stores memories, all of these organs uh, can work with a different outer environment, one that, in fact, is more packed with information. And our process of thinking, if you just think about learning, we can learn. Think about what could not have been known 100 years ago and what is learned today. Our brain was developed to learn and adopt. The, the basic structure that we've got is good enough, maybe not a whole lot different from what our ancestors had 70,000 years ago because evolution can't work in that short scale. But it's adaptable. That was what was so uh, important about Homo sapiens. Enormous adaptability in its genetic structure. So, on this IQ business, here's the gain in IQ points. So it's almost up by 30 points. But there's a distinction to be made. If we look at what's called just information arithmetic and vocabulary. This is how many facts you know uh, and how well you can add, for example, and uh, how much you can memorize, uh, that sort of thing. That score hasn't changed a whole lot. Uh, 
this is the average IQ, but it's broken down into two parts. There's this information acquisition part, which is all about vocabulary and how good you sound and how many words you know. And something up here, which is called matrices and similarities, what that is about is how to understand patterns, how to recognize cause and effect, how to recognize how parts of some complicated system are related to other parts. We have, that's the part of the IQ test that has been going up. And if you're trying to uh, parse the truth on the internet, that's what you need. You don't need to be impressed with something because somebody's using a lot of big words, which shows they must really know the truth. In other words, rhetoric, which is the thing that politicians are really good at, is not what our brains have increased about. What we have increased in is our ability to understand complicated situations, take them apart, and if there's a problem, try to solve it. That's more what we're getting better at. Not how to rally a whole bunch of people around you to go out and attack another bunch of people, which is what so much of rhetoric is about. Not just to attack, but the, the whole issue of rhetoric is about persuasion and that sort of thing. It's not about what I would call getting to the truth of the matter. So, um, I thought maybe I'd just mention a couple of case studies. Um, an illustrious senator from Oklahoma named James Imhoff, he's still actually uh, the chairman of, you know, he's the ranking member of the Environmental Committee in the Senate, said as early, as late as five years ago that global warming is a hoax. It's a complete hoax. We shouldn't have anything to do with it. And he, of course, is a very big enthusiast of fossil fuel and drill, baby, drill. Uh, and there are large numbers of people who were like him 15 years ago, even 20 years ago, huge numbers who have said, what, global warming? Uh, that kind of position, and, and the science at the time, even 20 years ago, was very clear to anybody who looked at the science. Because this whole thing, as you probably know, is based on the increase of what are called greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is a principal one, methane is another. These gases are produced when you burn carbon. And when you look at the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and we know the radiation cross-sections for that molecule, we know how much light it's going to reflect and how much it's going to absorb. That's a very well-known physical property. It's not fuzzy. And um, we also know, because we can drill ice cores deep into the Earth and the Arctic, which trap air that is up to uh, a million years old. And you look at the air that's been trapped, and you can measure the amount of CO2 in it, as well as the, other, the whole composition of it. So uh, when you do that, you find that these things fluctuate. For example, if there's a very big volcanic eruption, that's going to change the composition of the atmosphere. But what you see is a steady increase beginning with the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century that is steady and growing and matches the production of fossil fuel by human beings. So you measure the, the um, amount of CO2 in the ice core for the whole run of the last 300 years, or much more than that, 10,000 years, say, and you find that there is a big drift that's going on. The other thing you can do is say how much CO2 do I have to throw into the atmosphere before I begin to notice it? Now, if that turns out to be one part in a billion, you can say, well, I don't know about your claim about uh, the 
greenhouse gases coming from fossil fuel. But when you actually calculate it, we know how much CO2 is being pumped out. We know how big the uh, envelope of the atmosphere is. We calculate the percentage. It's really quite significant, and it's about the right number when you put it in with the radiation cross-sections of the molecule and calculate how much is reflected and absorbed to predict the kind of rise in atmospheric temperature that we're seeing. So the science is very solid about this, and it was solid 20 years ago. It's gotten more solid. So it's very hard, I think, to find a politician today. There, are, there, there still are some uh, who will say that this is a hoax. And I think it's not uh, an accident that this is coming at the time of this information age, the fourth information age, where you're not the only voice, the government is not the only voice, or a very powerful private individual is not the only voice. Um, there are other voices that can be heard, and they have substantive arguments to say why you are in error with what you say. Um, so, the other thing I thought I'd just mention, I, I, it's, it, I put it there for a different purpose, not that uh, uh, the worldwide sharing of information begins to ferret out the truth. Uh, I put it there because it raises other issues one of them is uh, got to do with government secrecy, and I'm going to say a little more about that. So I'm going to kind of slip over WikiLeaks right here for the time being, um, and go more to the issue of privacy and secrecy. And uh, these are these are unresolved issues, uh, and they're very important. First of all, privacy and secrecy are not quite the same thing but they are not completely divorced from each other either. So I would like to say that privacy has to do with the integrity of one's own person and thought processes. And actually there's a good reason for that. Uh, if you think about it, when you are, um, have something important on your mind, you usually have to think about it. You may mull it over for a week or two especially if it's something that's pretty emotionally important to you and involving serious issues with those you know or love. Uh, and so, if you thought about your mind being transparent so that everybody could watch you think, including those who may be important figures in what you're thinking about, you can see what kind of uh, disorientation and like it would, it would almost be impossible to do. So one of the things that we need privacy for in our own person and form is that we can't think without uh, previewing it. And very often when you're thinking about pretty emotional issues, you try out one thing. I'm going to tell him, no, no, I don't think I'm going to do that. Uh, I'm going to write no, no, it would be better if I write this. And you write, and you say, trouble right there, right now. Um, so there's a refinement that we do in ourselves. We work things over, and to be effective, you couldn't do that if, in fact, somebody walked by and said, oh, I see you're thinking about that sexual problem, or something like that. It, we need our privacy. To just function. So I think that's a very important fact about privacy. It doesn't cover the whole thing by any means. Now, secrecy is something different. It's a property of competitive struggle. Uh, why do we have secrets? Because we're trying to stop others from having access to that information because if they did have it, they could hurt us. Or not necessarily hurt us, they could take advantage of us, they could uh, acquire a higher status than we have, or uh, any number of things that involve taking advantage. So secrecy is not so much about <coughs> 
having a, an honest, uh, uh, closed, private forum where you can consult yourself and think about your thoughts before you make them public. It's more about competitive struggle. And this brings us to something that is, uh, from, from some perspectives, the most melancholy part of evolution. Natural selection. Natural selection involves uh, some organisms achieving greater reproductive success than others, and the genes that they embody will therefore go on, and the ones that didn't will not go on. It involves competition. And there's something to me that is both healthy about that. It's good to have some competition to so some um, stimulation of different individuals working on a problem or in an athletic event where the word really comes from, to be encouraging one another. You know, when you see these Olympic um, diving uh, champions kind of encouraging each other along, it's kind of a wonderful thing. So there's something good about competition. But it also has a very ugly side. Um, so privacy becomes more like secrecy in societies locked in zero-sum competition. Now, what do I mean by zero-sum competition? Well, there's a way in which the Olympic competition is kind of zero-sum in that if, 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 if I take first place, you can't. That's what zero sum means. It means there's a prize, and if you get one, then I have to get zero. Or if I get one, then you have to get zero. There's, it has to sum. Uh, so privacy uh, starts to look like secrecy when we have social competition. And there's an important myth. I'm putting a phrase in quotes here. Uh, the evolutionary psychologists have a term for what they call strategic information. Strategic information is information that we all have that we'd rather people didn't know about, that we want concealed. It's not necessarily out of uh, malice or um, selfishness, but we don't want it known. And in fact, there's a good reason because if it was known, it could lead to trouble and discord and upsetness. <coughs> and probably the most important strategic information that is around is whose partner, whose sexual partners are people's sexual partners. That's very important strategic information. And part of it is because there's a competition going on for mating that this evolves out of. So this is sort of the, some of the melancholy or uh, not so nice side of evolution. Now I'd like to try to, to, to see how we can think about this in a slightly more positive way. So competition is one way in which things can move, uh, in which you can have more Olympic champions if you've got strong competition. But another way is by cooperation, where individuals work together to create something much more wonderful than either of them could have done alone. And um, it's very hard for human beings to cooperate. So just look at the Congress. So um, there's an important way to try to understand what some of the forces in play are. And there's an important theory about this called reciprocal altruism. And it works this way. Why should, why should we cooperate with one another? Well, human beings are this preeminently social species. We have this big brain. This big brain knows who's who, uh, can keep track of who's done a good turn for you, and who, in fact, left you stranded when you 
ask for help, you can keep track of up to like 50 or 60 people. In fact, the size of the prefrontal cortex of our brains, or not just our brains, of all social species like some of our other primate relatives, like chimpanzees, baboons, uh, these are very social species. Uh, they're not solitary by any means at all. If you plot the size of their prefrontal cortex versus the number of individuals in the group, it scales with the size of the group. So we have a big brain because the size of the group that we evolved in was big. And that brain kept getting bigger as that group kept getting bigger. But there's a limit. There's a limit to how many people you can keep track of. So this theory basically says we have a mind. It keeps track of good deeds. And it also tells you, you better do a good deed for that person. They did one for you. And so there's a cooperation that takes place. A great one of this, I don't have a slide here, but there's a wonderful picture of Amish men. There must be about 30 of them up on this building, all wearing their black garb, their black hats. And they're putting up a barn. And, and it's this huge group putting up a barn for just one family. But what's going to happen is next month, that family, they're going to be there helping to put up a barn for another family. If they all had to never cooperate, you're on your own, they could never build barns like that. They had to learn to cooperate. So, there's the mind plus the deed. So the mind, people do good deeds and the mind keeps track of the deeds. And then there's something called reputation. And here's where um, things can start to get slightly nasty again. One of the things we're very uh, aware of are the reputations of people that we interact with. And if you could get yourself a good reputation by not delivering the goods, but, and not delivering the goods, you'd be ahead of the game <coughs> in terms of this competitive picture. So if you can manage to not uh, <coughs> deprive yourself of some of the benefits you could have gotten by putting your effort on your own account, but you could convince other people that you have, then you'd be ahead of the game. So the reputation business, which we are actually very aware of, and our minds have that capacity, uh, makes it possible for this deceit to come into the picture, which is, again, a not very happy aspect. So. Um, when we have good information shared so that people are quite aware, and this could be true in a small tribe or a small group setting, you don't have to have the internet. Um, Robert Trivers, who is, the, who is the originator of this theory of reciprocal altruism, has argued, and I think persuasively, that when you have information that's readily available, deception will evolve to true honesty. And so here's how it works. So my, my first goal is I'm going to try to deceive you. I'm going to try to tell you I'm, I'm a great guy to help you. Uh, and I'll give you a loan when you need a loan or any number of things. Um, but I've managed to, you managed to believe that because somebody else told you or I got, I got my reputation by not being true to how I really am. But what happens when that goes on is that people become sensitive to the fact that deception is a very big part of human behavior. Everybody knows that people are trying to deceive you. Just look at the ads on television. So there arises a counter-evolutionary pressure, which is basically the brain with analytical structures saying, I don't believe it. So then, the deceiver has to really do a better job at it. You've got to be really deceptive. So you've got to really tune up that deception system. But then, the receiver of the deception is also getting more clever too. 
I got a letter just before I came. It was from an automobile dealer, but it was in an envelope that said, priority mail, urgent, blah, blah, blah. And I open it up, and it's handwritten by the manager, but it's not really handwritten. It's so obviously done with uh, print. It's like he had personally done this and put it in the mail to me uh, to come in and trade in my car. And I looked at it and I said, why are you wasting your time? Um, so we get better at it. Well then, you got to get even better at the deception. Well, the best deception is to not deceive. Is to have a natural instinct for honesty. Is to just naturally go about having a natural instinct for honesty. And then your reputation is about as genuine as it can be, and you're not going to be found out as a as as running a, a gimmick. So that was Trigger's argument that uh, deception in the presence of lots of information, lots of interaction that can work on the deceit, will evolve people into true honesty. So, this is a new thought that I had when I was preparing this lecture, and I'm going to, I think, uh, try to uh, share it with some of my more professional colleagues, as well as probably give a talk on this in coming times at the Homestead here. The idea is the evolution of evolution. Now, what does that mean? Well, let me, before we look at the specifics here of what I wrote, let's just think about um, what, what, what would it mean to say that evolution is evolving? Well, my example is um, a lot of modern physics about cosmology in which we have uh, not one big bang. When we try to understand the cosmology of the big bang, it, um, it's hard to make sense of it. But you can make sense of it. You say, this happened before. There were big bangs before this big bang. But they unfortunately happened behind a time horizon so that they're not accessible to us. And when there are black holes, which I'm not going to go into detail, but you've heard about black holes. When a black hole gets massive enough and collapses, um, all of that information can actually be part of the rebirth of a new universe that is not accessible. Now, when that happens, the laws of physics the fine constants in the laws of physics, like the charge of the electron, the mass of the proton, the speed of light, these things can have a little bit of a different value. And when, in this new universe now, the history of stars is going to be different. In fact, in most of these universes, you won't even be able to make stars. It's so finely tuned that you have to have almost the exact parameters that we have for our physical constants. So the argument of how we got such fine-tuned parameters is that this process was an evolutionary process that had been going on and on. And when you make stars, you can make black holes. And the black holes are the birthplaces of new universes. And the ones that are successful at making more stars are going to make more universes and go on. And so you get um, a sequences of universes with different laws of physics. So uh, that was my analogy. So what I'm thinking about here is in, how many people more or less know how the theory of evolution works? Pretty much, good, okay. Um, what's key to evolution is what's called reproductive success. So in organisms, suffer a random mutation in their genetic code. They give rise to offspring that bear that mutation. If that mutation has made them a little more likely to reproduce in the environment in which they live, then that mutation is going to go on. And that's the way the process works. And that's the way this black hole 
We're birthing baby, baby universes, grow up to be big universes. They don't have sex as far as I know, but they then produce new universes depending on how many stars they make. So if you made a lot of stars, that's very good reproductive success for the universe. So if you have a lot of offspring, that's very big reproductive success. Okay, now, when human beings uh, have control over reproduction, which in some sense we do now, birth control is something that's only been acquired in the last 50 years or so, effective, effective birth control. Um, it's possible, and, and we also have large brains, which evolved for all of this social interaction. The goal of what we do can be socially constructed to say that's, that's what we want. For example, we don't want to do war anymore. Well, the, the, if we had nothing else, if our brains were in fact totally incapable of learning anything, then we probably have to live with whatever we've got. But I've explained to you how this big prefrontal cortex has the capacity to enormously learn things and to change its emotional behavior as well. For example, men get an enormous emotional high out of being with other men, killing other men. It's a very proven psychological uh, capacity that all males carry. But maybe we aren't so high on that. I'm not. I'm not. I don't really get off on that. And I think there are enormous numbers of men in the modern world who don't. Um, this is something of what I mean by the evolution of evolution, that this key thing called reproductive success, which is the number of offspring, doesn't become what determines what will be. What will be might be determined as much by economics, by philosophy, uh, by the consensus we all come to about what's a valuable thing to do, and what is not a valuable thing to do. So I kind of went out on a limb here with what you're reading. So competition in the standard evolutionary paradigm with reproductive success is a race. You're racing against others. What I would like to propose is love. Yes. Uh, that that's more the objective. And that's something that perhaps we could never have conceived of in the terms that we conceive of it now, but in the whole history of our species. And love is not a race. Love is more like a dance. So if all of these racers could slowly evolve, and suddenly they're no longer racing against one another, they're dancing. That could be a kind of evolution of evolution. That's the idea. And I'm going to end with a quote from the poet William Blake. So the race becomes a dance, and reproductive success is no longer the number of offspring. It is eternal delight. Thank you. Um, so we usually like to have a discussion and an uh, expression of different thoughts that people have and questions. Yes? Do you, do you really feel that that evolutionary process you're referring to there is actually a matter of reproductive success or is it more of a global consciousness? Or is that the same thing? Well, in terms of how most of nature works, uh, in terms of how most of nature works, uh, it's the biological 
it really is very physical, it's very biological, it really depends on how many copies of the gene go forward into the offspring. But you, you, the phrase you used was global consciousness. Yes. That's probably another possible uh, description you could give to what I'm trying to get at here. In other words, the, what in the hard mathematics of this business is called the payoff function is no longer number of offspring. It's uh, eternal delight. Yes? Thank you. We're talking about competition for information. Um, try and speak up so everybody can hear. When you're talking about competition for information, it's really evident now with the hacking going on between the various different countries to see how much information they can get of yours. Yes, yes. Do you remember the mad comic books? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember Spy versus Spy? Mm -hmm. It's a spy versus spy mentality. But maybe, slowly, the Trivers principle might actually come forward here. Whereas this is just, you know, you, you're just on a treadmill wasting your time. Maybe you should really just all be pretty straightforward. Yes? Uh, this is a very rational approach to this to life, I think. I'm just thinking about the impact of ideology and commitments to certain principles and certain theories about human behavior which mm -hmm. don't hold up under scientific scrutiny mm -hmm. and the indoctrination of people into those ideas and the way that impedes <coughs> one's ability to even think this way in the self-perpetuating system. They're going off stage. Yeah, I hope so. Well, just look. Um, just think about the number of countries that uh, prohibit the teaching of evolution. It just keeps declining and declining and declining. There were states in the United States that, that uh, banned the teaching of evolution. Kansas. Yeah, even recently they're still at it. Uh, but, but That's the school board committee. Yeah, it's... Um, if you look at the direction in which things are going, I think that's very important to look at the long-term trends. We saw that in the violence lecture. That if you just sort of look at the present and look at you know, the kind of massive uh, things that people can do, making very big explosions and so on, uh, you don't get an accurate picture of just how violent our species was. I don't know, were you at the violence? Yes, I was. Yeah. Yeah. I that was so, so we need to uh, put things in perspective. There's enormous amounts of ideology in the world because that's how it works. You have your, you, you have, it's again this business about competition. Each religious group is competing against another religious group. We have right now in Africa a very significant Christian Islam competition that's going on in several countries. They're impoverished. There's a struggle over very little resource. And the way you choose up sides is by saying what religion you belong to. I'm thinking of Rupert Murdoch and his control of the media. And the fact that these media empires control such things as textbooks and textbook pr production for the public schools, for the colleges, mm -hmm. not only in terms of evolution, but in terms of looking at social phenomena. But you know something? Yeah. Even 50 years ago, when it was just as bad, yeah. textbooks were just as bad. Now, maybe it was just the particular students that I were my friends and all. But I think it was true of most students. They thought it was totally uninteresting. You know, the civics book, the history books, they, were, they just took it as... as uh, it wasn't influencing their lives. It wasn't giving them an ideology. I think they get their ideology someplace else. It, it sort of maybe is one another bit of reinforcement. But most of us thought it was garbage. Mm -hmm. Yes? One of the things that I see happening, and you hit upon this 
with the smartphones and the big net that we have now is the downfall of situations like that where those organizations are no longer going to be able to be in control because I can, I can go out with my smartphone and prove that that wasn't true or I can actually become a Google product if I so choose. So those, those entities are no longer going to be there. Like you said, they're going on stage slowly and surely. And you can see that every day with the competition, if you will, of individuals or small groups coming up with Facebook and other things like that. So we know what's going on out there. It's not just NBC or Fox News or CBS. This guy over here found out the real truth of the smartphone. So it's fascinating to see the evolution, if you will, of this new age we have. Well, <coughs> there's still a documentation credibility problem, even with smartphones. Mm -hmm. uh, it needs to be, you know, one of the things about science is you can't do it alone. You can't come up with the great experimental result that you and you alone have done and have people accept it. It has to be replicated. There have to be other people who verify it. So um, what I think is possible is that individuals are going to try to use the platform that they have or the smartphone to perhaps promote themselves or, or whatever. At any rate, it's not going to necessarily be the truth. But with the number of eyeballs that are looking at it, many people will just not even look at it, won't even. But most people are using something rather sensational to attract attention, especially if they want to sell something. But slowly, people will just stop it. They just won't pay attention to it. You won't get traction unless you are genuinely um, in touch with reality that what you're saying is really real in some physical way or touches a deep truth of human psychology or spirituality. It's not just shooting the mouth off. And that's not easy to do. It's not easy to do that. It's not easy to compose a prayer that is a real prayer and not just yourself talking and hopefully there are enough people reading and watching who will bet, who will ferret out the wheat from the chaff. And the more you have, the better the chances for that. As I said earlier, when you constrain the social network so that well, very few voices are there, falsehood can flourish. But when the network is open, you may get a lot, you're going to get a lot of people that are just putting garbage on the net network. And that's an unfortunate price that you have to pay. But it's uh, overshadowed by the large and mostly intelligent thought that's there. Uh, I'm a musician <coughs> as well as uh, being interested in science. And, and I am utterly amazed utterly amazed at watching YouTube videos, for example, of very classical, very famous performances of, say, um, an opera singer like Christian Flagstaff. And you will see people saying, oh, thank you for putting this up. This is really wonderful. I saw her back in 1960, blah, blah, blah. And then there will be the most crude, and nasty, uh, scatological, uh, you don't know what you're talking about, why don't you go do that to yourself, by a person who actually is aware of this kind of music. And, and people, you know, it's sort of like, well, you're on the street and there's a dog pile, so you have to walk around it. But those things do exist, and I don't, um, I think the hope is that, they're, that they are going to exist, that they will be a small part of, of that of medium. On the, on the way here, um, I will not hear NPR's uh, discussion was on 
Can you speak just a little bit louder? NPR had a program on today that was biochemical ethics. They're talking about mm -hmm. and this, the issues involved with um, engineering, genetic engineering, and mm -hmm. all the, mm -hmm. the moral questions. Mm -hmm. And um, this lends to the same discussion, the evolution, the scientific evolution of evolution. Is mm -hmm. that part of what your, your message here is, is the, the power and wisdom of science driving human evolution at this point? I don't think I'd quite put it that way. Uh, there's a way in which we don't know how evolution evolves, because that's part, there's a random aspect to it, there's an unpredictability to it uh, in, in the microscopic. But on the, on the large scale, there is uh, a, a kind of order that you can see, not, not total order, but within species over a certain range of time, they evolve certain behaviors that make perfect sense against the environment in which they're interacting and so on. But how are you going to get from here to the next kind of species a million years later? You don't know that. Um, so what I, <coughs> this idea of the evolution of evolution is not something I've heard anybody in biological evolution talk about. And as I say, I come to this idea from physics, from cosmology. And they don't even use that word there, but it actually is what's going on in these cosmological theories of multi, multiple uh, universes with, that emerge out of the black holes that, uh, that uh, condense from star systems. And so that's, that's an idea that is extant in physics so that the process of evolution itself is in some sense evolving in the sense that the rules the physics, the laws of physics, which are the rules, are evolving. So the rule of reproductive success I'm proposing here could evolve to be a different rule of what constitutes success. And I am obviously relying on the human brain and the human mind, the collective brains and minds, as uh, departing from biological reproductive success to another measure of what's successful. I'll go with Blake. I've also been, been reading some of uh, Jared Diamond's most recent book, and he deals with the human behavioral differences among tribal peoples and um, what we call modern society, and poses the question of possibly some of their behaviors uh, would help our uh, advanced cultures. Mm -hmm. and just, Could be. Uh, how do you, how do you, um, do you see humans developing enough to, to control their own evolution and reproduction? Seems pretty touch and go, doesn't it? Yeah. It, it on the other so hand, on the other <coughs> hand, we have we have gone through. Uh, well, this is really from the last lecture on the decline of violence. Uh, it is absolutely amazing how the Western world, which was an enormously violent world, like all the others, uh, has entered a period of peace in the last six years. It's unprecedented. So, uh, human beings can do things that seem uh, unobtainable, seem very far off. Um, look at how fast uh, same-sex couples now have been given their rights. Suddenly. It, it would have seemed impossible five years ago. And, and I think it's uh, it's it's, I'm just sort of slightly amazed at that myself. And it wasn't so long ago that in, interracial marriage was, was taboo. When I grew up in the 1950s, I grew up in a Roman Catholic household. 
It would have been inconceivable to marry a Protestant, let alone a Jew. You couldn't even go to a Protestant church to uh, experience a service. That was a sin. Um, and I think, who was it that was talking about uh, looking at a, oh, was, was it you, Lisa, talking about looking at an old video from the 50s? I think she was talking about, and when you look at uh, news clips from, say, the 1950s, there's something that tells you it feels like a slightly different culture. It doesn't feel like America. Well, it sort of does, but there's something different about it. And I think that's most interesting. Because I don't think it's about our speech patterns having evolved, you know, that we don't, you know, that, we, that our accents have slightly changed. It's got more to do with a certain attitude of being in the world. So, um, you know, one of the great lessons that I think most people are not aware of is how dynamic the universe is. The key word of existence is change. That's what it means to exist, to be in motion, to be changing. Uh, we're in motion, and it's, uh, it's kind of accelerating right now. We're kind of in a pretty set of rapid change. But um, I'm happy to be alive at this time, and I, I wouldn't give it up for anything. Yes. There are some countries, I guess you would agree, in the Eastern Hemisphere who are fighting that change. Oh, countries are always fighting it. Yeah. The powers that be are always fighting it because the way things are is, is the way they want it. That's how they got to be powerful. Yeah. There is a tendency, yes, and uh, I don't want to. I wouldn't. I don't want to go too far overboard because you can't be completely unstable. No. You know, if, if halfway through my talk here I started falling apart, you know, I've got to have. There's got to be stability. There's got to be a certain amount of stability. In fact, there's a kind of healthy balance between stability, or what we might even call politically conservatism, a healthy balance between conservatism and progressivism. Right now, we don't. It's like the two don't know each other in this country. They don't even, it's like the idea of balance seems out of the question. Um, any other last questions? Yes. This is more of a thought question, but is there, is there any validity to the thought? And I know a lot of people of my age who share this. It just seems that children nowadays, by the time they're five or six years old, it seems to us that their that brains are that are pre-wired to handle the electronics than two or three generations ago. Absolutely. Perfectly. Uh, is that evolution or is it something else? No, it's, it's not evolution. <laughs> uh, actually, I spoke about this at Lynchburg College just uh, a week ago. The uh, prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus and these other brain structures um, evolved with like starting values, which come from the genetic code that you inherit from your parents. So their, their initial settings, they've got initial settings, like uh, certain kinds of fear heights, for example, just to take a crude example. You get, you get a certain initial setting when you're born, or when you're conceived even, of what that's going to be, what, what, what that's going to be. So, and then, you know, the whole range, the whole range of behaviors we have. Some people are quite fearless. Other people are uh, sensitive to loud noise more so than others. So there, I like to put it as uh, all these dials. They're not really dials, but the way the genes are connected when they construct these structures, like the network in the brain, it constructs a certain pattern that corresponds to somebody, for example, who is never gets upset when mouse, mice run around under the feet. Uh, but gets terribly upset if she has to take a mouse out of the trap. It's too disgusting. She doesn't want to touch it. 
So those two dials, are, and then there's somebody that's just the opposite. They, they don't mind. They don't mind taking the thing out of the trap, but they don't want those mice running under the feet. So there are all of these dials, and we come in with a certain initial set point. But the brain is so designed that it's got to adapt to the environment that it finds itself. So as the newborn grows, it's now setting, resetting those dials, tuning them, tuning them, tuning them to new settings. And uh, that will actually happen for a long time. And in fact, we know we can still learn things and even when where people are our age, we still can learn. And the prefrontal cortex itself is not fully uh, formed, its basic structure, until the early 20s. So most of the students I was talking to, for example, in Litchburg, had not yet achieved a fully functional prefrontal cortex. And the reason for that is they were incorporating what's happening around them not that they were consciously doing it, but that experience of life is feeding into those networks and they are tuning up to handle the kinds of social situations that they are encountering. Well, perhaps we shall continue individually. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.